Hello, everyone. I am here with Daniel Tut. He is the author of How to Read Like a Parasite, which is a new book on Friedrich Nietzsche. And uh, Daniel, how are you doing today? I'm doing well. Thanks. Thanks so much for having me. So I usually ask, uh, as a first question, what brought you to philosophy as a discipline? And then what's the history of your engagement with Nietzsche? I've, I've heard a little bit of the story from, from seeing you on other podcasts, but just to tell people in the audience who might not be familiar with you. Oh, sure. Definitely. Yeah. So I really started um, with a focus on history before I became interested in philosophy. And it was, in fact, Friedrich Nietzsche that really drove me to philosophy. And and I, to be honest, I think looking back, you know, as a young person, sort of 19, 20, starting college on the cusp of it is when I first really discovered Nietzsche. And this is sort of, this answers the question of why I became a philosopher, right? Uh, well, it has everything to do with the wide range of, um, what we might call the kind of massive bibliography that Nietzsche opens up for all of his readers, music, the ancient Greeks, the history of philosophy proper, uh, a window into the 19th century, arts, politics, you name it, is on the table for Nietzsche and written in a way which you at first do not understand or you understand very little of it, but that the fact that he writes in such an impressive style encourages you to continue to try to master the Nietzschean uh, corpus, right? So he was sort of my pivot from history into philosophy. And then over time, I became more politically engaged after experiencing concrete events like the Iraq War, um, you know, the 2008 economic crash. I became a Marxist and I became interested in like actual socialist work and political organizing. And then I became interested in how Marxism relates to philosophy and how philosophy can be inducted into the class struggle, right, into concrete politics. And so uh, we can talk about this as well, but that actually um, changed my relationship to Nietzsche um, in a certain way. So I, start off, I started off as sort of uh, a Nietzschean lover, um, somebody that really was thankful that, that I found someone like Nietzsche also for personal spiritual reasons, uh, which I'm sure, uh, Keegan, you can relate to, um, having to do with what Nietzsche allows you to overcome in, in terms of struggles that you may face in your personal life. Right. Mm -hmm. I don't think that there's a better example of sort of like a rugged, um, I don't want to use the word self-help, but a rugged form of self-overcoming mm -hmm. and you find in the work of Nietzsche. So I experienced all of those things, right? And um, also, I think also Nietzsche gave me an attitude towards the world of philosophy that I think was quite important for my younger years. So my story is one of, of the fusion of Marx and Nietzsche in an interesting way, right? The fusion of a kind of personal romantic attachment to Nietzsche and then a kind of more practical um, politicized attachment to Marx. Some great poet recently said to me over drinks that uh, there is no thinker that has overcome romanticism because we still live with the problems of romanticism because the problems of romanticism are bound up with the origin of industrial capitalism in the 1830s. <laughs> and that's very interesting yeah. because Nietzsche is, in a sense, um, emerging, right, in the history of European thought, right? At the end point, I would say of a certain form of romantic thought. And he he performs a certain um, scission on romanticism as we know it, right? And so, you know, the novelty of what Nietzsche brought about, the bombastic level of what Nietzsche brought about, the, the courage and the daring to maintain positions which are very confident is something that I always took with me. So Nietzsche taught me how to be a polemicist as well as how to be a mm. philosopher. Yeah, that, well, there's so many things I want to say to that. Mainly the 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 Nietzsche as an entry point to a vast bibliography has been, in a way, sort of the method of the podcast at this point is looking at all of his influences and who he read and who you have to read to understand Nietzsche. Um, so I also got that out of him as well. It's also, I've been thinking a lot about romanticism recently, and I almost wonder if it's just a, like a psychological, a perennial psychological issue 
just springing out of the fact that all of us become nostalgic, right, for our childhood, or uh, or at least most of us do. And it seems like there's there's a perennially stubborn uh, tendency to romanticism in human thought. So that's the, it, the, another neuron that fired when you were you were speaking there. The way that your uh, book is subtitled, the the left got high on Nietzsche. Yeah, something that you kind of hinted at when you were talking about Nietzsche just now. We, when we talk about Nietzsche, we often ascribe elements to his writing like he intoxicates people, he seduces people. Whereas it would be very weird to hear somebody saying that about, say, Kant, you know, um, just to use the easy, right. exa- easy counterexample. Why do you think that is? I mean, you kind of touched on it a little bit, but how does that work exactly? Like, what are yeah. the, the, what is the mechanism by which Nietzsche does this? Yeah, this is a, a great question, which you know, I I rely on certain other authors that preceded me, um, given that the Nietzschean um, corpus, uh, as Jeff Waite calls it, Nietzsche's core, right, which is a play on um, like an army core, right, which means that mm. Nietzsche is always multiple, right? There are multiple Nietzsches, and there are whole um, ecosystems of Nietzschean interpretation. So anytime we invoke the name Nietzsche, we are entering into a sort of rainforest of complexity. But one of the things that I try to say is that there is also a way to sort of clean out that rainforest, to sort of strike what we might call a more minimalist appraisal of what Nietzsche's core is, right? Again, playing on the notion of core, Um, because Jeff Waite, who I interviewed on my program called The Emancipations Podcast, uh, wrote a book in the 1990s called Nietzsche's Core. And uh, I really was influenced by this book, along with many other books as well. And uh, one of the things that Jeff Waite brings to uh, attention is an in, in insight of uh, Leo Strauss. Okay, Leo Strauss uh, has a certain uh, interpretation of Nietzsche's esotericism as bound up with uh, a community building project. Right. So my one of my claims is that there is a community building aspect of Nietzsche. And then the question becomes, well, what kind of community was Nietzsche trying to build? Um, he refers in The Birth of Tragedy and around that time in published material and in unpublished material to this community as a negative community. We know, for example, um, uh, in his lectures on education from the early 1870s, late 1860s range, um, he is invoking uh, socialism and the threat of egalitarian politics in Germany at the time. Uh, a lot of people may not recognize it, but The Birth of Tragedy was written right when Germany went from 35 mini states into the Second Reich. Right. And so that's, an, that's a historical event. That's a historical event. And Nietzsche is flirting at this early moment with national liberalism. He's very critical of national liberalism, but that is the sort of sea that he's swimming in, right? And I think as such, one of the ways to understand what Nietzsche's community is about is the invention of alternative myths, right? Now, this has become a debate, um, the degree to which Nietzsche is forming his community in opposition to socialism. If you take Georg Lukács, uh, in the destruction of reason, or if you take Domenico Lucerto in Aristocratic Rebel, they will argue very clearly that uh, it's undeniable that the Nietzschean community is meant to, and this is, I think, a key point, both my, perform a kind of mimesis or an imitation on the forms of socialist activity. The best example that, I've, that I that uh, I talk about is um, the distinction that Nietzsche makes between why does he name this community the free spirits? And we know that in contradistinction to the free spirits, there is a movement of socialist-oriented thought and practice called the free thinkers. And right. so you see, so there is something to that, right? And I think that one of the questions then is Nietzsche's trying to enact an alternative community, an alternative community to what? To the forms of what he perceives as vulgar equality, and the forms of socialistic leveling and massification that are going on, right? And which are affecting all different layers of society, okay? And so I think that I make the case building off of other Marxist interpreters of Nietzsche, like Lukács and Lucerto, but many others as well. Uh, there are certainly just two emblematic figures, but I could raise several other names there. 
that this is actually a way to understand Nietzsche. Now, um, what interests me about that is not the fact that he's a reactionary. I don't really care. Um, there are many reactionaries. I consider as a Marxist, like I consider a lot of liberals to be reactionary. So my definition of reactionary is broad. But what I am concerned with is when we do not consider Nietzsche a reactionary. I think that that becomes a strange problem in part because we replicate or we risk replicating on the left uh, the fusion of Nietzsche uh, with a socialist or left-wing project that tries to build the same structure of community that he tried to build. So that's my that's my kind of warning to the left. I mean, in some ways, you could think of my book kind of like a warning to the left, written from the perspective of a former, and still, I am still a lover of Nietzsche because I return to Nietzsche every, at certain seasons of my life, you know, almost every year, and read him with that spiritual intent. So one of the big challenges of my book, you could say, would be sort of, can you still have a spiritual reverence for Nietzsche while simultaneously pinpointing him as an enemy and a deleterious effect to the left? That's left to the reader to decide. Yeah, it, well, and I, I think I've heard you bring up that uh, in past interviews that Nietzsche wants this kind of uh, antagonistic relationship or agonistic relationship with his readers. He, if you have socialist inclinations, he wants to fight with you. There, there does seem to me, at least, to be a value to that. To if you if you find a thinker that is profoundly opposed to everything that you believe and articulates that perspective in a poetic and spiritual and beautiful way, and in a right. way that is seductive to many people, it would seem almost impossible to suggest that you shouldn't read them. I, I do appreciate that about your perspective. I do, it, it does naturally bring up the question to me though, having spoken to Devin Gore, and then you know knowing the existence of people out there like Jonas Cheka, what do you say to the arguments that Nietzsche can be integrated with the left. Cheka's argument would be something like, and I'm not going to do it justice here, you know, Nietzsche's a critic of socialism, while Marx is a critic of socialism, right? right. Um, Nietzsche is, as you say, opposed to the vulgar egalitarian leveling. Well, so is Marx. He, he's opposed right. to that sort of understanding of socialism. And we right. can, of course, go back and find in The Wanderer in His Shadow and couple uh, volumes of Human All to Human and uh, The Gay Science, many aphorisms that read, uh, to me at least, as anti-capitalist. Yeah. Uh, at least, you know, maybe not from a Marxist angle, but he does advance those arguments. So, so how would you deal with that sort of response to, to your position? Yeah, it's a great question. And part of this has to do with um, interpretation, right? Uh, Postmodern interpretations of Nietzsche, which you know, really became predominant in the 1960s. And a lot of this also, frankly, is important. And I talk about this in my in my chapter on um, Nietzsche within the left. It is striking the, I just, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get to your question, but I, I think it's important to set it up this way, okay? Gotcha. Um, it is striking, okay, to understand the function that Nietzsche played in the Second World War. Bertrand Russell, the great English philosopher, called the Second World War Nietzsche's war. Okay. And so there was an ethical, what we might call an ethical political conundrum on behalf of German specialists in the United States, but also in Europe after the war regarding how we are to reintegrate Nietzsche. Now, um, Montanari and Kohli were given the task in East Germany at the Schiller archives where Nietzsche's material remained. A lot of it was un still unreleased. And it all actually all wasn't released really until like the late 1970s, even in German. And there's an interesting story there because in the West, outside of the USSR, right, the release of Nietzsche's material fused with the left in, in profound ways, both in France and Italy. So May 68 in France had a left Nietzschean vibe to it. And then the uprising of socialist libertarianism in 1977 in Italy also had a Nietzschean hue to it. For example, there was graffiti uh, in the streets at this time that referenced Zarathustra, which oh, was wow. recently uh, translated and released by Montanari. Now, Montanari, I don't know if you knew this, was being um, 
uh, he was under surveillance during the entirety of his translation work of bringing the collected works of Nietzsche together by the East German socialist authorities. Okay. And so that's a fascinating background that a lot of people don't realize because why? Because after Lukács' intervention in the destruction of reason in the 1950s, uh, all of the socialist universities, you didn't see any dissertations on Nietzsche. So Nietzsche went quiet in the East, okay? Until the late 1970s, okay? Now, during this time in France, that's where you see uh, Deleuze and Foucault in particular, but also Bataille and Klosowski bring about a completely new way of reading Nietzsche. Now, Deleuze and philosophy in the early 1960s, uh, Deleuze's book, Nietzsche and philosophy, sorry, in the early 1960s is most emblematic. And if you read that text, and I talk about it a little bit, I don't give a thorough analysis of it. Um, we see a method of reading Nietzsche as what I would consider sort of radically detethered from the concrete historical uh, conditions that drove his thought. Right. Yeah, so, even, for example, even the master and slave uh, dichotomy is a psychological sort of event. Yeah, uh, that's right. Event. That, that's exactly right. And like, you know, he takes um, a small example, you know, he takes Nietzsche's um, motif of the tarantula. You know, why does Nietzsche call Rousseau a tarantula? Well, Deleuze takes this motif and he dehistoricizes it and argues that the left must conceive of Rousantimant because, you know, Rousseauism is a philosophy of Rousantimant and that Deleuze doesn't sort of interrogate, right? the imminent critique that Nietzsche is making on the left, right? So you see, this goes back to your point, which is, yeah, Nietzsche is making a critique of the left, right? Uh, and so my my book is sort of like, hey, let's open up a reading of Nietzsche as a great critic of the left, as we read him before, because then I also show that there was a time before the Second World War where Nietzsche was read by the left as what I call in a parasitical mode, okay? So that's kind of my wager. And I think that this is why my book has kind of hystericized a lot of Nietzscheans and bothered them quite a lot, because they are still very much attuned to what we might call a postmodernist mode of interpretation, which is, again, can be defined as a kind of dehistoricization. Okay. And so the question of my book, I think the provocation of my book, is not to say that Deleuze and Derrida that their interpretations are somehow not to be read or completely discarded. No, they perform way more creative readings of Nietzsche than I ever could. My question is more different. My question, this is for a popular audience, my book is, right? For an audience, for a time, for our time, right? Where socialist ideals, communist ideals are returning. So my, the question of my book is sort of like, how can Nietzsche, how can we struggle with Nietzsche for the realization of those ideals? Because keep in mind, a lot of what Deleuze and Derrida and other French Nietzscheans were doing, were they were making an imminent critique of really existing socialism. The May 68 movement was in many ways, right, an assault on French Stalinism, right? Now, we don't live in the era of bureaucratic socialism in the West anymore, right? That's no longer exactly a problem. Our, we have different problems. And so my argument is sort of that Nietzsche can open up a struggle for the realization of socialism if we read him with this tension in his time with that different methodology in place, okay? I think that's important background to your question now. Now that I've given you that background, would you mind uh, reiterating your question for me? Because I felt that that was important background. Yeah, uh, the question would essentially be, why can't we accept the criticisms that Nietzsche makes of socialism in the same spirit yes. that maybe Marx makes those criticisms. And maybe to draw on something you just said, maybe we could just see Nietzsche as a product of his time, right? Yes. Uh, that, uh, you know, we should place him within the, the 19th century. Um, why can't we depoliticize Nietzsche might be a, okay. a further, a further uh, sort of variation on that question. I'm not sure if that's what Understood. Jonas Schenk no, that, is doing, but helpful. yeah. That's very helpful. So I think that the methodology and interpretation background was super important. Now, let me answer this question now. Well, first of all, there's a risk, right, of a double standard, 
in meaning that we always apply Marx and our analysis of Marx and Marxism, right? With a rigorous historical scrutiny and judgment of history, right? For example, as Marxists, uh, the majority of Marxists today do no longer really have adherence to the concept of the dictatorship of the proletariat, even though Marx said it is his most important idea. So uh, why, my question is, do left Nietzscheans not apply the same historical rigor uh, to Nietzsche's, to the development of Nietzsche's thought itself? Now, when we dig into Nietzsche's commentary on capitalism, on political economy, I'm hugely influenced, by the way, by Dmitry Safranov's new dissertation, which he recently published called Nietzsche's Political Economy, which if you haven't read, I would highly recommend you get Safranov onto your program. It's a very interesting okay. book. So it turns out that Nietzsche read very widely in socialism. It turns out that Nietzsche read very widely, as you know, in the French Revolution. And part of the reason why he was drawn to history was a sort of response to what Wagner called the age of revolutions, right? Mm -hmm. And so Nietzsche is a young boy, right as an 1848 uprising occurs, where the Communist Manifesto is penned, right? And throughout his career, ever since he becomes a professor at the young age of 24, all the way up to um, what happened in Turin, right? Where he uh, lost his cognitive faculties, right? Yeah. I see a common thread of a commentary, an imminent commentary on capitalism, on political economy, and so on. And that is interesting because oftentimes it is beneath the surface. Sometimes he's not explicit about that. But there are we can we can also periodize certain stages of Nietzsche's development in this regard. And I do follow Losurdo's the four stages that Losurdo uh introduces, which we can talk about if you'd like. But nonetheless, what we find here is a romantic anti-capitalism. This is what Lukács calls Nietzsche's uh, critique of capitalism, romantic anti-capitalism. And that's important because if we understand what romantic anti-capitalism is, we understand moreover that it, it itself, forms of romantic anti-capitalism are diametrically opposed to Marxism. And so what is romantic anti-capitalism? Romantic anti-capitalism is interesting, and it really emerges after 1848 in European intellectual life, right? And Lukács uh, uh, documents this uh, in The Destruction of Reason. Nietzsche is not the only romantic anti-capitalist at all. We also find it in popular writers like Balzac, for example, and other so-called quote-unquote reactionary. But reactionary should not be understood in an extreme sense. A reactionary is simply, from a Marxist point of view, a figure of thought or a tendency of thought which wishes to retain a status quo arrangement. That's how I define reactionary. And we're building off of Lukács' definition. So in that sense, a romantic anti-capitalist is a critic of capitalism, but from the standpoint of either uh, the desire for the restoration of a lost tradition or a lost culture, they usually write from the standpoint of this missing element of culture that needs to stabilize the system. So romantic anti-capitalism is not interested in revolutionizing the system. That's the key point. And so therefore, Nietzsche is very unique because we know that he read Edmund Burke early on. And we know that to the extent that Nietzsche is conservative, he's not a conservative interested in a Burkean restoration of tradition. No. Mm -hmm. If anything, Nietzsche's conception of tradition is the whole temporality of tradition is is totally different than most conservatives would think about it as it is for Nietzsche, right? His is, if anything, about the invention of a form of aristocratic social life that would be futural, that would not be stuck in the nostalgia of the past. Now, um, where I think this becomes a problem for Marxism and for the left more generally is that a lot of what Nietzsche is talking about is about the retainment of certain forms of existing class uh, polarities and distinctions. One of the things that I think we should always remember is Nietzsche's statement where he says, my, my philosophy overall is best understood as a commentary on 
the necessity of rank order, not as an individual morality. Yes. And yeah. So the concept the Randians of rank, really hate that one when they're trying to make a Randian Nietzsche. Just to jump in real quick. Yeah, but but what is the concept of rank for Nietzsche? Now, building off of Safranov and his work, I really follow Safranov's lead, where he argues that the later Nietzsche, right, is really the fundamental concept of rank is a reflection on the category of physiology. Okay. And that is really interesting because in postmodern philosophy, as you know, a huge emphasis is placed on the body, right? Yeah. And now we have, you know, the notion of from Foucault of biopower, biopolitics. Nietzsche is sort of at the origin of that. This is another reason why Nietzsche's influence is so paramount in the humanities. You know, you can never escape Nietzsche's influence. But at the same time, for socialism, and for Marxist class analysis, you know, one of the things that I worry about there is when we fuse a, a Marxist understanding of class, because Marx has this idea that the task of socialism is the overcoming of class society. That, you know, Marx has this argument that there is a proletariat or a kind of emiserated working class that experiences a unique form of social degradation that needs to be overcome. And it also so happens that that class um, by virtue of their exploitation, is primed for revolutionary agitation. Well, you see, Nietzsche also spoke about this class, right? We know uh, in one aphorism, it is referred to as the impossible class. We know from Birth of Tragedy, also something like Marx's proletariat is recognized in the side of the Paris Commune, okay? So Nietzsche makes an allusions. He makes homage to the same class category that Marx is making homage to. And both Marx and Nietzsche refer to this class through the metaphor of, of slavery. But again, um, what I worry about here is that if we take Nietzsche's concepts of slavery and we take Marx's concepts of overcoming slavery and we scrutinize them very carefully, what I worry about is that actually it's at that point where we see Nietzsche's romantic anti-capitalism on the side of wishing to retain a form of a minimal form of slavery. Now, I want to be careful here because I think when we invoke Nietzsche and slavery, there's a lot of misinterpretations, okay? But it is a fact that one of the things that drives Nietzsche's political and social thought is an awareness, right? That the Greeks, okay, had discovered something both about um, theodicy, right? And suffering in the world and the naturalization of a minimal form of slavery. Now. This is not to say that um, Nietzsche's commentary on slavery is grounds or eligible for him to be canceled. They are subtle comments, but they are also, Keegan, if you read them carefully, quite um, dangerous in the sense that um, what I fear, right, is that we lose track. This goes back to the question of historicism. Because in a certain sense, when Eugene Debs, the American socialist, was running before mm -hmm. the First World War for president. You know, one of his platforms was the abolition of wage slavery, right? One of his uh, statements was, who will be the John Brown of wage slavery, right? Oh, and wow. so there is this, right? There is this question though, right? In modernity, right? Like, like today, we still have these forms of capitalist dependency, right? Do we qualify them with the name of slavery in all of its intensity? Well, that's another debate we can have. But you see my point, which is we need to ask the question, did Nietzsche desire for the transcendence of these conditions? And unfortunately, I don't think that he desired that. Okay. Right. So let's know that. Let's not cancel him. Let's not be necessarily, because you could see how emotionally that would just be so monstrous to say that. But we have to ask without fear, why did Nietzsche believe these things? Does Nietzsche have an insight there? One could follow the right wing, like say Bronze Age pervert, okay? Or this new right wing fascination with Nietzsche like Richard Hanina, right? And you know what they would say? They would say, yeah, Nietzsche's right about this, okay? To some extent. So what do we say on the left? Are we going to trust this one, this great philosopher that he is right? You see, this is also a question of authority. My position is, frankly, 
it's uncanny, like in the classic Freudian sense of Unheimlich. Yeah. Because if you have a philosopher that you fell in love with and you trust, like Nietzsche, when you're young, and then you grow to learn about some of his political positions and their compromised ethical status, it's a real question of like uh, revolting against the father. <laughs> it's kind of Freudian yeah. <laughs> Oedipus. You know what I mean? Yeah. It is. And even you, I would say like, it's at that point where we should feel with some degree of confidence on the left that, yeah, we can be opposed to Nietzsche at this level. Now, let me say something important. That doesn't mean that we are hysterical anti-Nietzscheans. Because I actually think that one of the strategies of my book is not to uh, participate in a kind of vulgar anti-Nietzscheanism. Because I have seen the downside of that. And the downside of that is that uh, anytime you try to cancel somebody, okay, it often makes their cause stronger on the one hand. On the other hand, we lose the richness of what Nietzsche actually brings about. Because it's, it's one thing to say, I think that his views on slavery are um, dangerous and wrong. But it's another thing to say, well, what Nietzsche says about human suffering offers insight. Those are two right. different things. It's subtle, but you see, I hope you see my point. Yeah. Well, and also the Bronze Age perverts of the world, you can see the way in which a hysterical reaction to them makes them sort of silo off into an ever more extreme accentuation of those uh, problematic elements that you bring up. I do want to raise, if not an objection, I just want to push this issue a little further, though. Please. Um, because... And I'm trying to think of a good way to formulate it. Are you, are you familiar with uh, Robert uh, Mickel's sociological study, Political Parties? Um, I don't think he's the, so. He's actually. the guy who comes up with the phrase iron law of oligarchy. And he oh, basically yeah, yeah, was yeah. like, he's a socialist. Phrase. He went fascist. But, you know, it was sort of the before any of the crimes of fascism, really. And he was an old man at that point in Italy. So, mm. Um, mm. you know, he gets a little bit of a pass for not being able to see the future. Um, but because he his whole career was based on grappling with this issue that he was a socialist, and he saw the way in which in the trade union structure in the socialist parties, you know, he the point he makes at the beginning of the book is that we should expect to see an aristocratic party arrange itself hierarchically and according to if we can bring in Nietzschean language order of rank, right? Mm -hmm. That shouldn't surprise us at all. But when all the socialist parties do it too, that sort of raises an eyebrow for him. And he goes through, and it's not really a philosophical work at all. It's it's a tome that basically lists every single concrete reason why in a political party, what happens is that as soon as you've elected a delegate or, or somebody who's going to be wielding the power, there's a steadily growing gulf between them and the people they're supposed to, to represent, right? And that, um, and he talks about the reason why, well, you may say this is just because of representative democracy, he talks about the reasons why, uh, you know, in practical terms, everyone being informed about every single issue of the party is not going to be practical. There has to be some sort of technical expertise. And then the bosses of the party control the communication with the arms of the party. They control the financing, which is, allows them to create loyalty among the members. And then it gives people all of these perverse incentives and so on and so forth. I mean, it's a it's a really voluminous work, so I can't really do it justice. But so then maybe phrase this in the form of a question. I could put the argument to you that when Nietzsche says, makes these statements about command and obedience and order of rank, right. and then we look at what happened in, say, the Soviet Union, where you have a Politburo who is set above the, the average person, you know, they're not really answerable to the proletariat. Uh, I know there's all sorts of different views now about what the Soviet Union actually represents, what Mao's China actually represents. But I think in general, uh, especially during the time of, of Stalin, it's clear that they went in a perverse direction or that it was a deranged form of Marxism. And a Nietzschean critique might be, well, yeah, that's because the order of rank had to be reestablished, that human beings were going to organize themselves in that hierarchical manner. Uh, and actually, one of the, the arguments that Mikkels makes in that book is that Nietzsche's fear of the levelers was actually entirely wrong, because it's not possible, is what uh, Mikkels puts forward. And so I think there's a way of reading Nietzsche 
and looking at many of the, the remarks that he says about slavery, which are, you know, I, I appreciate your response, but I think some of the things Nietzsche says about slavery are, are, are not very careful or measured, <laughs> the things that he actually writes. I mean, he says we need to create new forms of slavery. Right. Um, that uh, perhaps the tyranny and exploitation needs to be heightened, which is mm -hmm. uh, incredibly radical things to say. But I think there is at least something valuable in considering what if what Nietzsche is attempting to to explain to us here is something that I think he perceives as a sort of a law of nature. And I know that's that might be contentious in and of itself to call something a law of nature or, you know, a lot of people will say that's appealing to the natural fallacy. Right. That doesn't mean that it's correct just because it's natural. But what if it's inexorable? And and so what would be your reaction to that? I, sure. I wonder. Yeah. I mean, I'm 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 thinking here of. Um of Nietzsche's reflections and his uh, kind of veiled reference to Rousseau in Zarathustra, where he says, we will create uh, temples over the cave of Rousseau and dance on them, right? So there is a certain sense in Nietzsche of not merely a critique of the movements of equality that were opened by the French Revolution, which of course Nietzsche called the modern slave revolt, right? It's not merely a critique. There's actually no. There's a an interest in in obliterating them, actually, and in, in defeating them, right? And so, what that poses actually for us today, right, is an interesting conversation about liberalism and the status of equality today. Is what I argue in the in the latter parts of my book, right? Which is, uh, what is the meaning of equality? Now we know in capitalism that um, there is what Marx calls a false equivalence. And so if social life is subordinated to commodification, Marx argues this in the early parts of Capital, right? well, that's a kind of um, falsified or inadequate form of equality. It's not uh, the real equality uh, that Rousseau spoke of. It's not the equality that drives uh, egalitarian politics. And so what happens is that people in capitalist society um, lose a desire for equality, is my argument. And so Nietzsche knew that. Nietzsche knew that the problem was this desire for equality. And that actually links to Nietzsche's critique of Christianity in a curious way, because it was the equality of souls, right? This kind of metaphysical, transcendental form of equality that was a problem for Nietzsche. But it was also a problem of the movements of socialism themselves, right? So Nietzsche always saw that as fused, we, we might call the kind of Pelagian elements of Christianity. And I get into um, the Pelagian debate uh, in in my book as well, and I and I contrast Pascal with Nietzsche in that regard. And so, what I'm trying to say is that egalitarianism, in my reading, and Rousseau, in my reading, is not anathema to Marxism. In fact, if you read early Marx, you'll see so much uh, influence from Rousseau on the on the political Marx, not on the uh, economic Marx. So it's a question of political Marxism for me. Now, why equality I think matters for the left is because the form of equality that we have in, in capitalist society or what you could call bourgeois society is ultimately an oppressive equality, right? Because it only allows us to think a form of equality tethered to the logic of capitalist valuation cycles and commodification, right? We're, we're sort of limited in that way. And so I really follow like, you know, Alain Badiou and other more contemporary Marxist thinkers that want to recenter the, the problem of equality. So in that now, now in that regard, now what Nietzsche says about equality, we can still learn a lot from it, as long as, and I think this is a key point, and this is one of the things I argue as well. We see that there is a certain comprehensive uh, strategy that Nietzsche develops hardwired into his concepts. So for example, I make an argument that we can understand both resentiment, which is a form of political resentment, which kind of go exceeds mere resentment, as well as even the eternal return of the same, okay? Back through Nietzsche's critique of socialism, right? And the only way to make that claim, that in other words, that Nietzsche's concepts have a, or even the pathos of distance, right? Those three examples can all be linked back right, to this common critique. Now, when we understand that, that's both good news for socialists, but it's also kind of 
possibly bad news for Nietzschean uh, philosophers. Well, it's bad news for Nietzschean philosophers because it, one consequence could be, oh, well, we can't write any more dissertations about the eternal return of the same because these Marxists have just pinpointed its true logic. But now let's pause there. That's not. That's actually not my claim. What I would rather see, and let's let's revisit the effect of Lukács's intervention in the 1950s in the socialist USSR. Okay, remember that. What I would rather claim is that this critique, the, the let's say my attempt to resurrect the, the Marxist critique of Nietzsche, would allow for a greater blossoming of Nietzschean studies, not shutting it down. I think that's what like Devon and a lot of people are worried about with my book. That I'm ultimately the effect will be that I shut down investigation into Nietzschean scholarship. On the contrary, my friends, it's not my desire or interest. I just want to add a new perspective that we can use. Right. Now, with that new perspective, some on the left may have a kind of uh, vulgar anti-Nietzscheanism, but again, I, I warn against vulgar anti-Nietzscheanism. Right. So I understand that I'm hitting on a sensitive point, and I don't mean to necessarily create those effects i'm just trying to give people a way in to understand a logic of how nietzsche's nietzsche's thought and concepts work i hope that makes sense yeah i i guess really what i'm trying to get at though like outside of the left though like so do you think you think egalitarianism is an attainable goal is that how you would describe it ah yes now let's talk about that okay so in leninism right which is a form of marxism which mo you know, most Marxists have some allegiance to, right? Um, there emerges the notion of the vanguard party, which is a theory of leadership. Now, curiously, Lenin argued that the vanguard leadership should be composed of intellectuals that are exempted from wage labor. Now, one of the things I talk about in my book is how Nietzsche is a curious uh, interlocutor <laughs> at this yeah. precise point. Why? Well, because we know how much Nietzsche talked about the importance of the free spirits having an exemption from labor. What did Nietzsche say about the meaning of having a nine to five as what we would oh, call it? Yeah, uh, that anyone who doesn't have two thirds of his day to himself is still a slave. Exactly. And you know what? I mean, in a certain sense, even though that's a hyperbolic statement, there's a lot of truth to it. Yeah. But, it, but if you think about that, that's a think about the bar that he's setting for you. It's an extremely hard bar to achieve, right? I mean, yeah. that's kind of an entrepreneurial dream that everybody's that the fantasy that we can. I, I guess, but a lot escape. of a lot of CEOs and entrepreneurs don't meet that, you know. Well, like, I mean, it's they have to be very focused on their business. They can't ever stop thinking about it. So this is an interesting point because I have a whole section on Nietzsche and leisure time. There's a big focus, and it's it's an example of how we can constructively work with my new reading. Because the capitalism that Nietzsche lived in was, was based on what Veblen called conspicuous consumption, which meant that the ruling class, the, the upper bourgeoisie, right, the truly rich, they actually were happy to be exempt from labor, and they needed no need to justify their exemption from labor. Well, if you look at the neoliberal period, post-1970s, it's the exact opposite of that. All of the like uh, upper bourgeoisie and very wealthy people, they flaunt how much they work. Now that's actually a paradox because what Nietzsche uh, recommended to rulers is that they lead lives of austerity. Right. So Nietzsche's, Nietzsche's uh, prognostication or his advice, let's say you happen to be wealthy. You know what Nietzsche would say to you? Uh, do not flaunt your wealth. In fact, live austere so that you can set an example to workers to live austerely. So you see Nietzsche is also a certain prophet of austerity. And that also poses a real question, similar to your question of egalitarianism, and you're asking me to reflect on it outside of my interests of politics. Now, I think that in a certain way, this is where Nietzsche becomes a sort of secular post-Protestant prophet. Because part of like Hegel's theory of work and labor, right? Why did socialists correct the errors of rich people? Like in, in Mao's time and Stalin's time, they sent them to work camps. So labor, right? So like labor is a force of negativity in Hegel's conception that corrects, has some bearing on the truth. 
on the social truth, right? So there is a kind of, therefore, a fundamental insight that Nietzsche is working with about labor and about austerity. While at the same time, Nietzsche is also recognizing that the condition of the working class is under what he calls, uh, well, he says the condition of modern capitalism requires extra work. Work that uh, machines can do, but also we need a class of people that will be content to do this work. So Nietzsche has a sort of strategy, a theory for that reality. And that's actually where I argue Rosentiment partially comes from, which is when socialists say that that class of, that are subordinated to do extra work should not be happy in doing that work. Nietzsche sees that as a great problem because this goes back to why I see Nietzsche as a reactionary in favor of status quo. Because ultimately what's Nietzsche's design, his in interest and intent overall is actually for the harmonization of the social order. Even though Nietzsche is a, a like the French uh, Nietzscheans talk about like for chaos and for disorder and anarchy and to some extent, no, actually, I think his politics at the end of the day are for the harmonization and stabilization of the social order. That's a paradox of Nietzsche. Yeah. So uh, am I addressing your question at concretely regarding man's relationship to equality as such? And my my claim would be that, um, uh, in, in fact, you are right, that Nietzsche does offer a lot of insight and wisdom in, in this regard but that we must treat that wisdom as a double-edged sword. Because if we ignore the design, the strategy for the retrenchment of a certain form of indentured class servitude, if we ignore that, we make a partial reading of Nietzsche's insights. Because right. also his negative insights are also valuable insights, even though they're negative. So I would say yes, but also no on this side. And we have to see, that's why I call Nietzsche a Janus faced. There's two sides of Nietzsche in some sense. And part of what the problem I have with left Nietzscheans is they can't really confront this other side of him. That's also how Go Nietzsche ahead. describes uh, Theogenes, uh, a, the Yanis faced uh, nobleman of ancient Greece he wrote his dissertation about. Uh, who, it's, you know, it's interesting because there was a book about that that sort of paints Nietzsche as sympathetic to Theogenes. But when I read it, I, I, I almost saw the origin of Rosentiment in this nobleman who's losing his status. Okay, so that opens up a couple questions for me. I mean, just for one, I guess I would say, though, if egalitarianism, though, is always going to be threatened or every attempt at it will be perhaps unconsciously guided by this subversive force to organize ourselves into an order of rank, right? Uh, subversive to the goal of, of egalitarianism, we might say, right? If that is there in human beings, and Nietzsche is pointing to that, isn't there a danger if, I mean, I, I know you're not saying that socialists should ignore that, but I, I guess I'm just wondering what, how do socialists in dialogue with Nietzsche take that? I mean, it, do we have to have a vanguard party if we're going to have a socialist revolution? Does there have to be some sort of uh, Politburo? Is the anarchist view of uh, how socialism is achieved, is that correct or incorrect? Can there ever be a truly classless, stateless society? That's sort of what I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, because that to me seems to be the, the real obstacle that Nietzsche puts up. Uh, as the real opposition that he puts up towards the socialist project. I understand now. Yes, that's that's quite helpful. I mean, in some sense, we have to always historicize in this regard. And um, here I'm sounding like Frederick Jameson, but I think it's true because we can't speak about this in an ideal sense, detethered from certain sequences of political expression and political revolution. Because one of the things that my reading, one of the consequences of my reading is that we understand Nietzsche as an anti-revolutionary thinker, because in a certain way, one of the things that we have experienced since the collapse of the USSR globally is the ending, according to many, uh, I'm thinking of Francois Furet, for example, in his work on the French Revolution, where he argues that... Uh, well, really, the collapse of, this, of the USSR was the end of the French Revolution in its grand historical sequence. 
This is related to Fukuyama's notion of, po of uh, post-history, the end of history, right? This is related to Nietzsche's reflections on the last man. So you see in a certain way, uh, Nietzsche, I would argue, why does Nietzsche say that his thought will be with us for the next 2,000 years? I would argue, I would submit to you that Nietzsche and Nietzscheanism is inextricable from revolutionary politics. And that we can only understand Nietzscheanism as a parasitical attachment to revolutionary sequences. Mm, that is yeah. why, that is why, check this out. Are you aware, for example, and Adam Curtis references this in his latest film uh, on the Chinese Cultural Revolution, you know, Madame yeah. Mao, Mao's wife. Jiang Qing, you know? yeah. Yeah. Did you know that she was a Nietzschean? And did you know that her curriculum reforms of like theater and arts and humanities broke from socialist realism, inspired in large part by Nietzsche? There I is a. Not, I uh, did not know that, but you can. Madam uh, Mao, you can research it. There's a great article yeah. about it. You can research it. Madam the, the Mao letter and that. Nietzscheanism. Sorry, the, the the letter that Curtis uh, reads out that she 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 wrote to her uh, uh, husband who tried to commit suicide was that it reads very much like a Nietzschean that she's uh, you know um, seems almost like an individualist in some ways. Um, That's would, exactly right. Yeah. That's exactly right. So I think you know, like Safranov says in his dissertation, you know that Nietzsche is Nietzsche's um, prophecy is. First of all, it needs to be kind of detethered from the metaphysics of Christian prophecy. But it is a prophecy tied to a long arc of revolutionary politics to exist for the in the future. And so the semiology of Nietzsche's concepts and ideas are also future-oriented. I mean, it may sound cute to you, but I, don't, I, I take it very seriously. When Nietzsche says, my philosophy will truly begin after great socialistic wars. I take that mm -hmm. to be an example of, of, of a truth, like, because that's what happened. <laughs> right. I'm sorry. It is. Yeah. And that's, that's why we are talking because this uh, philosopher has been capable to, capable of making such statements. You see my point? Yeah. yeah. So, uh, in that regard, Nietzsche is a kind of parasitical figure that will emerge. This is one of the claims I make in my book in the future and in our time in the post-French Revolution, the wake of that, at any moment in which the social order is undergoing an egalitarian upsurge or revolutionary moment, Nietzsche will be tethered with. Why, uh, for example, in Alan Bloom talked about this in the American Civil Rights Movement when he was a professor at University of Chicago. It's a moment where the social order is undergoing a change. He said all of his students, many of his students came to his office hours complaining of schizophrenic episodes. And nine times out of 10, he said they would raise the name Nietzsche. Yeah. So for me, Nietzsche is a thinker that is tethered with the question of political revolution. And I think moreover, that that is sort of his value as well as his um, stickiness and danger to the left. Because when he's invoked in that sequence, it then becomes a, intellectual uh debate that's why we're having these nietzsche debates today right uh you see my point so yeah. for me that's how i read him and i think he will always be read that way whether that's for the next uh 2000 years or that's up to history to decide but that's where he will emerge for me and um and that's why actually this guy wolf wolfgang harik when he in the late 1970s in east germany very interesting figure. Uh, he was a Nietzschean uh, at a young age, and um, he became an open critic of the Nietzsche Renaissance in the late 1970s in East Germany, right? And he was a critic because he thought that the, the reintroduction of Nietzsche into East Germany, right, after his absence for several decades after the war, he feared that this would actually lead to the ending of socialism in East Germany. Now, I think that's a little bit hyperbolic, and I think that's an idealist claim to make, but he does think that that's actually, it was a contributing factor to the, to the fall of right, the Berlin yeah. Wall. Okay, yeah, so that's an interesting point, but I mean, 
and I, again, I think it's too strong. Okay. But let's honor the reality for a second. Let's honor the reality and also honor why the left got high on Nietzsche. What is my meaning with that? It's the idea that in revolutionary sequences, what is the meaning of putting Nietzsche at the center? That's my question. That's my question. My question is not, how do we kick Nietzsche out of the vehicle of the left? My question more so is, how do we put Nietzsche in the, in the passenger seat? <laughs> Rather than the my, driving, driving the bus? <laughs> not Yeah, I don't yeah. want Nietzsche to be the driver. Right. That's my, that's my worry. Yeah. Okay. Well, it, so you mentioned Alan Bloom. I remember, uh, yeah, I read his book and I remember hearing an interview with him where he was, he, he said some similar things to what we've been talking about today that I, I didn't actually recall that, that anecdote you just mentioned with the schizophrenic episodes, but how he mentioned that his students were, were either completely turned off by Nietzsche or they were absolutely absorbed by him and that there was no middle ground. And he recognized, mm. you know, mm. uh, this is a, I think what most people would consider to just be sort of a mainstream conservative thinker. And he recognized the danger, so to speak, of Nietzsche very clearly. If, if we could turn to the, the left who, who got high on Nietzsche, uh, you know, maybe a, a good figure or an exemplary figure to consider might be somebody like Foucault, who sort of becomes like a left libertarian by the end of his career. And it makes me wonder, is that the kind of thing that you see, you know, placing Nietzsche in the driver's seat? He has this appeal as, you know, I remember in the uh, preface to Deleuze's Nietzsche and philosophy, he talks about how all around us, we're creating new kinds of conformity and that even people are mm -hmm. using Nietzsche's name to create new kinds of conformity and people are using mm -hmm. socialism to create new kinds of conformity. And Nietzsche has that, you know, maybe that's part of the negative community building exercise of saying, don't, you know, you don't have to follow the viewpoints of your culture. You don't even have to follow the tinge of your own conscience. You can be completely your own person and find your own way, so to speak. You know, do you see that kind of attitude? For one, I, I can see how that can be valuable to a social critique. On the other hand, when you have some of the French postmodern post-structuralist figures, you know, when you look at where they end up, it's not clear that uh, Nietzsche aided them along in, in, uh, you know, articulating the Marxist project. Mm. Um, and, mm. you know, maybe with Foucault, particularly, uh, the understanding, and maybe you can give me your understanding on Foucault. Um, sure. The understanding that I've heard put forward from many on the left is that he, you know, essentially went reactionary in so many words. Okay. Yeah. This is a big debate. Foucault and neoliberalism is, is usually the moniker, uh, and, um, that is given this debate. And, I don't, I want to be careful here because again, my reading interpret interpretive method is never to, um, shut down, um, the contributions. I like to think of my approach to utilizing thinkers as a Marxist, like a scalpel that we can, um, perform a certain operation on thinkers, whether they be like he Heidegger, for example, right? I, Richard Wolin has revealed the extent of Heidegger's Nazism. You know, that teaches us something, but it doesn't uh, mean that all of it is for nothing, right? Or that, that we should discard it entirely. And the same goes with Foucault. I mean, Foucault's um, theories of power, right, are, are so vast and so essential. So what does Foucault say about Nietzsche? He says, famously, the only valid tribute to thought such as Nietzsche's is precisely to use it, to deform it, to make it groan and protest. And then he says... If commentators then say that I'm being faithful or unfaithful to Nietzsche, that is, is of absolutely no interest. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, you know, that that's where Foucault's coming from. So, you know, Foucault's not going to be crying over, um, uh, I don't know, the little things when it comes crying to Crying over Nietzsche. spilled interpretations. Well, is that well, is that the problem no, with the postmodernists in general, though? That well, they, they I don't mean, this seem was... to have a faithful, they don't seem to consider a faithful interpretation to be a real thing, even. That's correct. That that is that is largely correct, which is why for them the text exceeds the context in some sense. The text exceeds the historical dynamics. It, it exceeds even Nietzsche himself. That's why they talk about the politics of the proper name in Derrida of Nietzsche, 
So in that sense, they almost elevate Nietzsche to a figure of thought whose concepts exceed his own intentionality. And they therefore can transcend the question or the problem of, of both intentionality as well as the historical materialist dynamics that we talked about earlier. Those aren't a problem for them anymore, okay? Right. It's therefore now operating at a, at a standard of interpretation of metaphor and uh, at a level which is um, detethered from historical concerns. And I think that that's their hermeneutic. That's their approach. Now, let's tether with that and see what they kind of produce. Now, politically, I think one of the things that Foucault contributed or tried to contribute, and so did Deleuze in his own different way, is a sort of contribution to thinking subjectivity, right? Beyond the capture or what Deleuze and Guattari call the coding, the repressive coding of bourgeois okay. society. And that, that means that for them, uh, Nietzsche's critique of the bourgeoisie, okay? And we know that Nietzsche has a big critique of the bourgeoisie, can be used as a weapon for facing the contemporary struggles of the 1960s and 70s, okay? Which was what? Which was, uh, you know, the lingering repressive status of the bourgeois family, right? The problem of bourgeois narcissism, right? This is why Nietzsche's individualism allowed for these French thinkers to think of such a radical form of becoming beyond all representation, a radical form of difference, okay? Now, the question that I have for socialist politics in our day and age is the degree to which those hyper-militant forms of left Nietzscheanism um, undermined right, the, the project of organizing socialist parties. Now, I will confess that when we have that debate, it is glamorous and sexy to think that form of self-overcoming, right? Like Deleuze and yeah, I'm even thinking here of like Guattari and anti-psychiatry, for example, you know. At the same time, the neoliberal era has presented our subjectivity, if you want to use that term, with a fragmented social order, right? Where that kind of radical antinomian spirit of self-overcoming, capitalism in a certain way already voice that upon us. So that, what I'm trying to say is that historically, those revolts of French Nietzscheanism happened in the context of the post-war welfare state. When we had class mobility, we were not living in what some people call neo-feudal arrangements, right? So there's a historical conjuncture piece and question there of strategy. And also Deleuze and Foucault were very critical of organized socialist parties. I don't think we should be, okay? Right. So we need we need a new appraisal, right? Of 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 Foucault's of of Foucault's political Nietzscheanism, okay? And a kind of uh, what I would call a more sober treatment of it, and that kind of goes back to my thesis on the high, the feeling of the highness. Now you may come back to me and say, well, uh, we still live in very repressive conditions, and people need to overcome them. And to which I would respond to say, of course, that's true. And if you use Nietzsche in that way, more power to you. You see, again, my my wager would be more of a warning. Like there's limits at the same time. Okay, there's yeah. limits. Like, yeah. So, uh, what would you think of, uh, or do you have an opinion on the Black Panthers and their reading of Nietzsche? Oh yeah, like folks like Stokely Carmichael. I mean, you might even be able to somewhat convincingly source the phrase black power to a Nietzschean influence. Uh, yeah, I have a section on this. I okay. write about this. Yeah. Uh, is, that a, is that a positive thing? Is that a negative thing? I mean, how, how do you see that right. interaction? I see it actually as mostly positive. Okay. And part of the reason I see it as positive is because I studied Huey Newton's Nietzscheanism and how he read Nietzsche. Okay. And when you go back and you look at what he had to say about Nietzsche, I read him as a highly parasitical reader of Nietzsche, okay? which mm. is that he's using he's he's using Nietzsche as a scalpel. He's making a scalpel incision, and he's incorporating. I think the most important text for Huey Newton in his appropriation of Nietzsche is on truth and line in an extra moral sense. Okay, it's a very fascinating text, which, as you know. It's an early text. And I yeah. actually think, Egan, that it's the most important Nietzschean intervention for left politics. Really? Okay. Term. 
Yeah, I think because. everyone should read that book or that essay, the Unfinished, really. <laughs> yeah. It's really interesting, isn't it? Right? Yeah. Because it's the first book or the first uh, contribution, what you could say, to discourse theory. And the fundamental status of the subject's relationship to truth qua metaphor. And so when you realize that, when you recognize that political myths can have this transvaluation, and that when you have that transvaluation, it affects the body and the political affects of the subject. That's exactly what Huey Newton realized in the use of words and language. So it's a theory ultimately of the power of words and language in political myths is how I read it. And I think that's how Newton read it too, because I show that Huey Newton basically tried to depacify the black proletariat using Nietzsche's concepts from that right. essay and from Nietzsche's work on power more generally. So that's a positive contribution, but it's really positive because he's using it in a limited way. And I think that that's powerful. Again, going back to my question of should Nietzsche be at the driver's seat where we just sort of switch on the green light and trust Nietzsche to sort of be the, that's kind of what Deleuze did. If mm. you read his manifesto nomad thought, he very clearly says like, the great hermeneutics of suspicion, Freud, Marx, Nietzsche, Nietzsche is the best. Let's put him at the center. <laughs> I think right. that's a problem. But the Newton uh, approach, and and of course, you know, the other thing, uh, and I got this idea from Jeff Waite in my interview with him on my podcast, Jeff Waite said something when we weren't recording. This is before I wrote my book, right? He said, he said, no American or no one has written a definitive study on Jack London's Nietzscheanism. You know, huh. the, the famous uh, novelist. Yeah, the, yeah, Traveler. Yeah. So I wrote a whole section on Jack London, right? Where I tried to do that, right? Yeah. And I think Jack London, like Huey Newton, has a similar approach of using Nietzsche for the left because Jack London was a great socialist. So that's actually the distinction I make between um, elective affinity readings like Deleuze and Foucault and Bataille and others that put Nietzsche at the center versus what I call parasitical readings, which I'm more open to, right? which is yeah. use a scalpel, appropriate with caution. Well, and actually with the Black Panthers, it makes perfect sense now to me, or it's clicking. I, I kind of got it, but now I really get it. When, the, when you said the phrase that Huey Newton used Nietzsche to depacify the Black population, essentially the, the most abject underclass of America at that time, probably still. Yeah, right. Which is the exact opposite of Nietzsche's own um, own prescriptions for society, mm -hmm. and yet he's able to use Nietzsche in that way. Uh, it does kind of raise that with untruth and lies in the non-moral sense, and the way you were talking about uh, the use of political metaphor and and so on, and you know the fact that in that essay, Nietzsche suggests you know. Uh, that truth is just a movable host of metonymies, anthropomorphisms, yeah. and so on and so forth. And that essentially the truth value of a claim was tied to the usefulness or, or the positive benefits or results from using the regular designations. They agreed upon designations for certain metaphors. How does this play into or, or relate to Nietzsche's reading of the sophists or of the rhetoricians? Uh, where do you stand on... I guess maybe the dialectic versus rhetoric, because, mm. you know, there is something really powerful there in Nietzsche's point, but I think where Nietzsche's coming from is from that identification with the point of view of, you know, Thrasymachus and, and, and these figures from Plato's dialogues who essentially say, there is no underlying truth that we are coming to in this dialogue. I'm simply articulating my perspective, you know, the, uh, the strong do yeah. what they will, the weak suffer what they must, so on and so forth. Where do you stand on that? Do you think? Yeah. Uh, well, I, I, yeah, that's that's very helpful. I mean, I think where I stand on that is I fall in line uh, with the philosopher Alain Bedieu's reading of Nietzsche in this regard as not quite a sophistic uh, position, but as what Bedieu calls an anti-philosophical position. And by anti-philosophy, um, Bedieu argues that the sort of will to power is largely can largely be construed as a linguistic operation which is tied into perspectivism insofar as any utterance um is itself eluded 
from both the perspective, while it is perspective of the person that utters it, while it is also um, uh, decentered from that perspective. So it's like both and. And then moreover, where Nietzsche is not a sophist is that the development of the notion of the eternal return would be tied to a metaphysical affirmation beyond the flux of the exchange of linguistic utterances amongst different perspectival agents. And that that affirmation of something beyond that non-changing dynamic allows for Nietzsche's vitalism to have a kind of comprehensive metaphysics. So there's, there's a certain uh, encapsulation of Nietzsche's metaphysics tying both uh, his theory of language to the will to power, to the affirmation of the eternal return in a very nice bundle in Badiou's conception. And he calls that anti-philosophy. And he says that Nietzsche is the most important anti-philosopher for whom there's a whole genealogy stretching back even to St. Paul and to Pascal and to Kierkegaard. And Nietzsche is kind of in that lineage, right? Yeah. And one of the things that that lineage brings about, right, is the centrality of the subjective. Was that to say that Nietzsche is a subjectivist? But it is to say that when you do philosophy inspired by Nietzsche, you need to pay homage to the subjective, to the perspectival. Okay. And that's what I try to do in the first chapter of my book. If you may remember, I say, like, actually, yeah, we have Ecce Homo by Nietzsche, which is this great sort of autobiographical exercise. But also, Nietzsche is kind of encouraging you as the philosopher to also be autobiographical. You know, this point that Louis Salome makes, right? Which is that Nietzsche discovers that every great philosophical system cannot escape biography. Okay. Right. Uh, so for me, that means something for us, which is like Nietzsche is encouraging us to make a focus on the subjective. And I actually think that a lot of academic Nietzscheans don't honor that about him. Yeah. And I think maybe some of them are bothered by my inclusion of my own biography <laughs> into my story of this book. Have you, have you heard what Deleuze said when asked about that? Uh, where, where he, he rings a bell. Remind me. Yeah, where he said uh, arguments from one's personal experience are bad and reactionary, something of that nature. <laughs> yeah. That it, 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 and, and it, that was prefaced, I can't remember it verbatim, but with him saying it doesn't matter who I am or where I came from, which to me was one of the, it's one of the only things Deleuze said where I had like a visceral uh, negative reaction to it because how could you read Nietzsche and come to that conclusion it, it, it's exactly so, it's so strange to me but given everything that you've said it actually kind of makes a lot of sense because a lot of his engagement with Nietzsche involved dehistoricizing him yeah true so it's yeah, funny I mean, you never in, know you never sorry, know what Nietzsche would say. I mean I always think what Nietzsche would say about my project you know on the one hand I like to think that he would honor my attempt to reposition him as an opponent to socialism, because I think that that's valid. <laughs> but I don't know what he would think about my attempt to fuse a particular form of biography. Because I mean, I think, and um, Tracy Strong has written about this very well, um, Nietzsche and biography. Like, you know, where Strong says, like, Nietzsche's Eke Homo started, actually, when Nietzsche was a young boy reading Emerson. Because mm -hmm. what he was working on were fragments of what would become Ecce Homo. That was like his most consistent project. Okay. Really? Okay. And, and he even says uh, in an incredible essay that um, how the birth of tragedy out of the spirit of music was inspired by the church organs that Nietzsche heard at his father's funeral. And that he juxtaposes that event with the first time Nietzsche heard Wagner's music and how that transformed him, which you may remember that passage of what he says about that, right? Yeah. And how all of that is fused into some kind of singular biographical insight that exceeds. So for Nietzsche, I think biography always exceeds the subject, is what I'm trying to say. So whenever you invoke, I think Deleuze is right. But I think where Deleuze would be wrong is to say, well, then you can't speak of it. No, I think you can still speak of it. You have to honor, though, at the same time that you have... Uh, you're speaking of it as, um, like I said before, with the notion of perspectivism, as almost like detethered from your own authority. This is like Foucault's death of the author. 
speaking of it as detethered from your own authorial capacity or authority, if that makes right. sense. I know it's complex, but. So you, you have an interest in Freud. Um, I do. Do you have any comment on, because when you're bringing up the death of Nietzsche's father, when he's about five years old, and then when he meets Wagner, uh, Wagner, who seems very clearly like a surrogate father figure, I've kind of described him as the father mm -hmm. that Nietzsche wished he had, wished that he had, or the father that if Nietzsche had been able to choose a father, that's who he would have picked. Mm -hmm. um, and then you also have sort of a mother figure in, in Cosima. I know there's all sorts of strange allegations uh, about Nietzsche's uh, attraction to her, but that just makes sort of the field of inquiry even more interesting from a Freudian perspective. Do you think, how does that affect Nietzsche's biography there and his relationship, the death of his father and his relationship to Wagner? How does that tie in with how you see his philosophical project? Yeah, I think it's valid. Again, Tracy Strong has a great um, article on Nietzsche and Oedipus. It should it should be noted that um, Nietzsche has four or five references, symbolic references to the underclass, to the working class, to the proletariat, as in a condition of um, being blinded. And we, of course, of course, we know Oedipus at Colonus right. was blinded. That's a side point. But the the motif of what Nietzsche will call in a lot of his fragments in the Nautilus of um, a new Oedipus is an important one, in part because by the time we get to Eke Homo, uh, Strong argues, and I agree with him, that really Nietzsche has overcome the problem of the father. And that this actually is part of the reason why a lot of the French, like Derrida has a whole book on this as well called Autobiographies, which I talk about. And I think Derrida is very smart in this essay, where he basically says what Nietzsche has discovered Part of the reason that Nietzsche can give himself these dramatic personae, I am all the names of history, or an even Zarathustra, and calling himself Christ, and so on, is because Nietzsche has struggled so hard to overcome the dependencies of the Oedipus complex itself. And so mm -hmm. by the time he writes Eke Homo, there's a certain radical subjective freedom. This is also tied to Nietzsche's notion of the good European. And even I would say Nietzsche's notion of cosmopolitanism, because Nietzsche is trying to break boundaries. And those boundaries are also paternal boundaries. Okay. So in that sense, you can see why a psychoanalytic milieu will uh, find Nietzsche quite radical in this regard, because Nietzsche knew something about the problem of paternal authority. And I think that he was for sure traumatized by the early death of his father added to which his father died of a brain disease, some mysterious origin. And Nietzsche, of course, feared that his fate would be the same as his father's, right? So Nietzsche's always wandering away from the father in a certain way. Now, I don't agree that Wagner is an Oedipal figure, maybe for the early Nietzsche, but I do think that Nietzsche overcomes that. I definitely yeah. do. Now, you could superimpose my political critique to that overcoming and say, well, yeah, he overcomes Wagner, and there's a, a latent political theme to that. So you can analyze it that way, but you could also analyze it purely psychobiographically. And I actually have a section in my book called The Limits of Psychobiography. And I get this idea from Badiou, who says, you can't really appraise the concepts and ideas of a thinker when you psychologize them. Like I'm reading, for example, this critique of Wilhelm Reich, and they discard Reich's theories because of his psychological traumas. And I thought to myself, like, that's very unfair. You should critique mm -hmm. a thinker based on their ideas, not based on what happened to them. <laughs> right. Uh, well, and for me, yeah. the, what's interesting is often the way in which the, in which the psychological, uh, the psychodrama within the person is a reflection or uh, their ideas are a reflection of that, but it doesn't, it doesn't seem like a, a free pass to dismiss those ideas. No. No, I mean, this is why in, um, you know, John LaPlanche wrote this very well-received book called Holderlin and the Question of the Father, which I thought was a very important book to read because it is an analysis of Wagner's, I'm sorry, of Holderlin's um, schizophrenic breakdown. And it just so happens that Holderlin produced the Hyperion, you know, his poetic novel, which is a very unprecedented paradigm-shifting work under conditions of a psychosis. Mm 
Okay. Now, when you read that, it's helpful to know all of that, but you don't need to know all of that in order to be moved by it. Right. You know what I mean? Like, in so that's why, in some sense, for me, the question of Nietzsche and madness is not one that should be over determinative. Yeah. I mean, I obviously have a problem with folks, uh, academic Nietzscheans, that say, well, because of his madness, we can't trust any consistency of political prescriptions. I actually would argue that you can. That's a side point. But you see my point, I always have a allergy to overly psychologizing thinkers. So I want yeah. to be very careful there. Um, but to go back to the question about like the Oedipus complex and Freud and Nietzsche, I mean, you know, Freud said he never read Nietzsche for fear that he would be too influenced by him. And I think that that's interesting. But I, we also know that Lou Salome was an, gave a presentation to Freud's inner circle once. And she was obviously an ardent Nietzschean, okay? So, and Jung uh, obviously gave a whole seminar in the 30s on Zarathustra, which I talk about a lot in my book, by the way. So Nietzscheanism and, and Freudianism are highly compatible. It's almost like passing of the wand. Right. And I would actually argue that so much of Nietzsche's concepts of the drives transfers into a more elaborate systemization in Freud. For sure. Right. And uh, that's something that I've written a bit about. It's not really the focus of my book, but it's of interest to me. Yeah. Yeah. And I can definitely, I actually kind of buy the argument that if Nietzsche perhaps was absorbed with, you know, some sort of Oedipal relationship to the Wagners, it, it is interesting that by the time of Eke Homo, by the time he publishes that work, and he's commenting on the case of Wagner. Yeah. The entire commentary is about the Germans. I mean, it, the, the almost right. the whole thing, almost everything he has to say about Wagner is very sort of conciliatory. And uh, it's almost like he wants to leave behind the notion, my real problem with Wagner was with Wagnerians. And uh, that's totally. how I read it anyway. Well, uh, it's been great, Daniel. Uh, just as a final question, like where is Marxism today, both in the academy? Mm -hmm. uh, and what do you see as the possibilities for Marxism in physical material reality, we'll say. Yes. Well, towards the latter part of my book, I try to make an argument that one of the effects that Nietzsche has had within internal to the left has been a de he has tended to, Nietzscheanism has tended to de-emphasize both the centrality of egalitarianism in socialist practice, and I've already touched upon how I think that that is detrimental, but also Nietzsche has affected the question of class. And especially because a lot of left Nietzscheanism operates on what you might call a kind of post-class theory. And I think that Marx is a thinker that put forward a highly robust analysis of class society. And that academic Marxism more broadly, and to some extent left Nietzscheanism, has encouraged us to move away from the question of what class emancipation means. And so I would like to see the blossoming or like the flourishing of a Marxism for our time that puts the question of working class emancipation back on the table. Because I think, like I say, the, I, I title uh, my first chapter, We Live in Nietzsche's World. And I really mean that. I don't mean that as like a historical anachronism. I really, I really think that so many of the social ills and problems of Nietzsche's world persist in ours. And a big one of them, a big one, is the persistence of the problem of wage labor, right? And the problem that the huge majority of people in capitalist society are subordinated to a condition that there is almost no escape from, right? They're then furthermore subordinated to a form of kind of like semi-tolerable emisceration, right? Either like, you know, this fact that over 60% of Americans live paycheck to paycheck. This right. to me is the heart of what a socialist politics will transform, you know? And I think that um, that's what I'd like to see. I'd like to see Marxism ex go beyond into, out into the real world and to latch into political movements, start to take these ideas and fuse them into actual practice. Um, and I think that Nietzsche like I said before, will always be a part of that. You will always be a sort of appendage or a parasite to 
to the left. And so my book is just really an awareness of that and a kind of um, invitation to have a pugilistic relationship to him. But again, that pugilistic relationship can also be a kind of um, one of admiration, one of admiration both for the success of his project, but also for the profound insights that he brings out as yeah. well. I mean, are you, are you hopeful for, for the future? I'll put it like that. For me, I think I am in the sense that a lot of bourgeois politics or kind of like, you know, predominant liberal politics have actually kind of failed people in a certain way, right? We're at a, we're at a, we're at a kind of moment of a certain nihilism, <laughs> right? Yeah. And uh, that should be seen with a certain optimism. Um, you know, then we have the question of like, you know, Nietzschean pessimism come in and so on. Uh, but I think that there's reason for optimism precisely because out of that failure, we have no other option but to continue to fail better or right. at one point, hopefully to succeed. <laughs> the neoliberal God is dead and uh, perhaps never did a wider sea of possibilities exist. All right. Well, thank you very much for your time, Daniel. Uh, obviously, you have the book. Uh, I'll put a link in the description. Is there anything you want to shout out or uh, just let people know about at the end? Uh, sure, you can check out my podcast, um, Emancipations, where I have a section on there, a playlist um, called New Directions in Nietzschean Studies, where I post you know, my various conversations. I'll probably post this conversation there as well. Awesome, awesome. Well, thank you very much. And uh, it's been a pleasure. Uh, all Likewise. right, everybody, signing off. If you enjoyed the Nietzsche podcast or found it helpful, you can visit us and support the show at patreon.com slash untimely reflections. The link is in the description. Or just share the show with any of your friends that you think might enjoy it or on social media. Thank you for your support. <laughs>